So um, let me start by welcoming everybody to, to this event. We're, we're really privileged and very proud to host the launch of this, of this report from the International Rescue Committee. I, I actually think just having read it yesterday, it's, it's really a tremendously important report for, for two reasons. One, one, the very obvious one, that this, this is absolutely a watershed moment for Afghanistan. We have elections this weekend. And that political transition is, is happening at a really critical time when we're seeing uh, decreases in a very serious economic problem, which have called into question your prospects for future development. But, but I was also very struck when I was reading the report by the way that you capture the hopes and the aspirations and the ambitions of ordinary people in Afghanistan. And you know, the, I, I think for, you know, for all the difficulties in Afghanistan, to, to my mind, the country has actually seen one of the great development breakthroughs of the 21st century. Because if you went back to 2001, there were fewer than 1 million children in school in Afghanistan. We now have 8 million children in school, 40% of them girls. And that's actually an extraordinary achievement. And I think it demonstrates what is possible through the right combination of, of aid, working for domestic capacity building, and international solidarity and support, and we, we really need to make sure we keep that at this very critical moment. So I'd, I'd really encourage everybody to read the report. Um, bef before you do that, I want to introduce our really very distinguished <coughs> panellists. Um, in New York, I think ad ad advisedly David chose to stay in New York, you probably heard that we're being coated with sand from the Sahara, the worst <laughs> pollution that we've had for I don't know, s since you were here, actually. <laughs> but, um, but, but anyway, it's, it's, it's great to have you, David. I, I think you, you really need no introduction to anybody in this room. Da David is now president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. Prior to that, of course, he was um, Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs here in the UK. David is going to speak for 20 minutes or so um, to, to the themes in the report. Uh, I'd also like to welcome on, on my left Sir John Holmes, who many of you will know, who's now Director of the Ditchley Foundation and Chair of the UK Board for the International Rescue Committee. Um, until 2010, um, Sir John held the position of UN uh, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs. Um, on my right is Chelsea Purvis, who's Policy and Advocacy Officer at the International Rescue Committee in the UK and also author um, of, of the report. And in New York with David is Ashley Jackson, our very own Ashley Jackson from ODI, um, who I, I would encourage you, Ash Ashley has done some really path-breaking work here at ODI with the Humanitarian Policy Group and in particular wrote a report called Talking, uh, Talking to the Taliban, which is hugely influential and I think a fantastic piece of research. So. Uh, we, we really look forward to hearing from all of you. Um, there are a couple of things I was told I have to mention before we start. The, f the first one, um, obviously turn off your mobiles, um, but the hashtag for the event, David, I think you've been running a conversation on the hashtag for the last couple of hours. Um, yeah. You have to stop that now and talk to us. But, um, but if, you want to, if you want to do it, the, the hashtag is uh, hashtag Afghan future. Um, and so with that, David, I'd like to pass over to you to talk to us for around 20 minutes. And then I know you have to leave directly after that, but we'll have a question and answer discussion here in London. Thank you David. very much, Kevin. It, it's really brilliant to be with you, if only um, electronically, but I have the great benefit of being here with Ashley, who um, in her writing over a number of years, I think including when I was still in government, has done some really brilliant work about the situation in Afghanistan and taught me uh, a lot. And I, I think I'm right in saying you were the special advisor to the International Development yeah. Committee for their report in 2012, uh, which I've uh, had the benefit of rereading, and it is really a, an important uh, piece of work. Uh, so you've got a stellar panel. Um, my job is just to introduce uh, the report and then let you have the debate with the um, panel. Uh, I thought that I would just start with where my engagement with Afghanistan started. It, uh, and my first visit to Afghanistan was in 2007. And I went to Afghanistan uh, in July, at the end of July 2007, as Secretary of State. And uh, it so happened that my visit coincided with the death of the late King Zahir Shah. 
And I raise that because Kabul, that day for the funeral of Zahir Shah, was an extraordinary sight because there you had, I don't know if you were there at the same uh, Not quite time, yet. <laughs> uh, the, um, all of Afghanistan was represented there. And it was just the most extraordinary introduction to the diversity that existed within the country, but also an introduction to a really profound sense of Afghan national pride and identity and commitment that had endured even through what was then 25 years of uh, civil war. And I always think back to that uh, day, really, that, that four or five day visit, because it was the best possible way to begin to understand some of the challenges that exist, but also some of the indomitable uh, determination, pride, hope, aspiration that I think uh, continues to come through, including in the report, which Kevin, you very kindly uh, mentioned, and really want to thank ODI for bringing together what I gather is an extremely distinguished group in the room uh, in front of you. Uh, to try to take forward the dialogue and the debate, because I think you're right in saying this is a debate that needs to start, um, rather than see this as any kind of uh, conclusion. Uh, just for those of you who don't know, uh, the IRC uh, was founded by Albert Einstein in 1933, when he fled to New York uh, from the, the, the then rise of the Nazis. Um, it's been, we have been in Afghanistan for about 25 years. Uh, we are present in nine provinces and about 4,000 villages, uh, significantly through the National Solidarity Programme, which I'll come back to talk about, and employ about 700 uh, Afghan staff in the country, a very small number of Western expat um, staff, uh, and we provide a range of services, um, food, education, shelter, um, health uh, as the main uh, ones. Uh, I want to start just by reminding people that the, for all the, the fact that we can recognize some gains that have been made in the last um, decade, Afghanistan remains ranked by the Human Development Index as the 175th poorest country in the world out of 186. The needs are great and uh, they in some ways have, have risen over the last year or two and we can come back to the reasons uh, why. I also think it's important to put on the table, I mean, we're a humanitarian organization, we adhere to humanitarian principles, uh, we speak, I think, with a very strong commitment to impartially meeting need, but I don't believe we, could, we should somehow isolate ourselves or pretend that there isn't a wider context to our work. And although we're not in politics, we have to live with uh, politics that exists. And the truth is that Afghanistan remains a country of strategic importance for the region. And uh, we all know, those of us who've spent time there or studied Afghanistan, that what goes right in Afghanistan can have positive influence in the region, and what goes wrong in Afghanistan can have negative influence in the re region. And as an organization that uh, takes a lot of its um, moral purpose from dealing with refugees and IDPs, uh, we've got a lot of work to do in Afghanistan and in the neighbors, which I want to uh, come back to. And so while the needs are great and the strategic importance is important, the central warning of our report is that there are grave dangers of thinking that a moment of military drawdown or a year of military drawdown is a year to think that we can, we in the West can finally, if you like, wash our hands of the Afghan trauma and think that um, it's time uh, to up sticks on the civilian uh, side uh, as well. And in that context, I mean, speaking, I did a press conference here in the US and cited the figure that uh, the US development effort has been cut by Congress from $4 billion a year um, three or four years ago to $1 billion uh, this year, so uh, cut down to a quarter of its former size. I think it's important to acknowledge speaking, and actually, to be fair, I made this point uh, to the US press this morning, uh, but certainly to a British audience, it's important to recognize that the UK government has committed to maintain the level of overall spend, 178 million pounds, so maybe 300 million dollars. And that's an important signal that the, uh, the commitment that the UK has made is one that we want to see made more widely. There are some details about the way the UK has, is allocating its money that I'll come back to, but I think it's important to put on the table, just as a bit of context, that the overall commitment that's been made by the government, certainly for next year, is a good one and, and should be recognized uh, as such. 
Um, and the, the central message of the report, which was developed by a task force including Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, uh, Jim Wolfenson, former President of the World Bank, um, both of them are IRC um, overseers, they're not on the board of directors, but they're overseers of the IRC, the so-called board of overseers. John Holmes was on our task force as a uh, member of the board of directors, and then three or four others with Afghan experience. Uh, we wanted to make uh, two points uh, in writing the report and producing the report uh, today. And the first point is to say that Afghans, the people of Afghanistan, continue to need our help. And they need it um, uh, in the face of uh, really quite significant uh, challenges, social and economic challenges. Five million people, according to the UN, are in need of humanitarian aid uh, this year. Uh, but there's a second point which I think is equally important and which I want to reflect on in my remarks, which is that it was a central theme of our discussions that the way we spend aid, the kind of aid we give, how we give aid, is almost as important as, what, uh, as how much aid we give. Because uh, there's absolutely no point in hiding the fact that uh, while $30 billion has been spent in uh, aid over the last uh, decade, um, an awful lot of it hasn't reached the people it was intended for. And that's something that I think we should front up about and learn the right uh, lessons of. So those two messages, on the one hand, warning against the dangers uh, of a reduction in civilian spend, but also insisting that uh, learning the right lessons for how to spend civilian money, aid money, is, is incredibly important. And those two messages, interestingly enough, came out of not just the discussion of uh, the eight or nine of us on the task force in New York and Washington, it came out from the engagement that we had with our staff in the field. And I think, Kevin, when you referred to the spirit of the report, the spirit is really not, uh, I hope John doesn't mind my saying that, this it's less my spirit, his spirit, Madeleine Albright's spirit, it's the spirit of the 700 staff who uh, we surveyed, uh, the 124 who filled in quite detailed forms or had um, interviewed. And I just want to um, uh, give you a sense of their um, priorities. That They highlighted three things for us, overwhelmingly more important uh, for them and for the people that they were serving, because we tried to ask uh, both about their impressions and about what they thought of the communities they were working in. And these Afghans told us that security was a major concern. They fear uh, rising insecurity over the next um, few years. Uh, that secondly, uh, that jobs and livelihoods are under threat. Um, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs are actually at risk from the withdrawal of the military forces, because of course the military were engaging a lot of Afghans. And uh, thirdly, interestingly, education came through as a very powerful uh, priority um, that uh, our staff reflected on, perhaps reflecting the gains that had been made there in a sense that uh, those gains have stalled and that now is the time to try to recommit in that uh, area. And the spirit I got was fear. You, you could feel the fear that people have got. Uh, you can sense the hope and you ca have above all a sense of the commitment because this is their country. They have no choice about another country. Uh, they're working for us, but they want to um, make a difference in their own uh, country. And that was especially moving uh, to me because in my first week uh, as the president of the IRC, I had to deal with the fact that we lost five of our staff in a security incident in Herat uh, in, um, in the southwest of the country. And uh, the fact that we had these staff, and you can read the quotations in the report, were so committed to not just their work for the IRC, but their devotion to their own community, I think should inspire us as well. Let me just say a word about the part of the report that deals with our sense of what works. And I think for, if I understand the guest list for this, um, for this seminar or for this discussion rightly, I think this shouldn't come as a surprise to many of you, but I think it's important to try and work on it and harden it, because I think if we're to convince our fellow citizens, we've got to make it really, really tough-edged. Uh, and that's the point about what works in aid uh, delivery, and essentially three thoughts uh, came to us very, very strongly. That all of our experience is that community-led uh, initiatives have far more chance of reaching the people who uh, um, need them than those that are top-down, and especially those that are top-down uh, and, and imposed from outside. And how we, it seems to me that there is a category one question 
uh, for the aid community, which is how the Afghan government and we with them build on the National Solidarity Programme, uh, which I think has avoided some of the problems of corruption that have plagued other uh, initiatives and that have given us an infrastructure, not just of people, but of trust and credibility around the country. And our challenge is to build on that infrastructure of trust and credibility. Uh, the second area, or the second lesson, is that uh, we need to find a way to build a bridge from the humanitarian effort to the development effort. And IRC does provide a range of services beyond the absolute minimum of humanitarian intervention to save lives. But when we are not in the um, long-term uh, infrastructure business, if you want to put it like that. We're in the human infrastructure business, but not in the physical infrastructure business in the main, although I suppose in some parts of the world we do some water projects. But we, we, we've used this metaphor of the bridge between the humanitarian and the development, because for many of you will, will be as sick as I am of people trying to pigeonhole, are you in the humanitarian community, are you in the development community, and the categories feel less important. But we do think it's important to signal that Afghanistan is, a, is an emblematic country when it comes to building a bridge between the short term and the medium term. I mean, I am very, very concerned to, to, to learn that the immediate UN humanitarian appeal, $406 million appeal, is only 22% funded at the moment. If you want a bit of evidence of the dangers that are being run at the moment, it's from the fact that the world community is turning its back on that UN appeal, which is for humanitarian help for 5 million Afghans now. But while we are insisting on the importance of that, we don't want to get trapped into a belief that it's only the, the immediate humanitarian need that matters. Another four million Afghans are, are, in, are according to the UN, in, in need of uh, help, education, shelter, etc. Um, and so I think there's an important theme here of how you build a bridge between the short term and the medium term. Uh, and obviously education is important to that. The third uh, theme is that our uh, most successful effort has been that which has worked in partnership with the Afghan government but hasn't been owned by the Afghan government. Uh, and that sense that we, that successful aid works with the informal, some call them tribal structures of Afghanistan society of its 40,000 villages and valleys, uh, that seems to me to be a very important theme. That partnership, with, partnership cannot just mean partnership with government. It has to mean partnership with the informal structures of Afghan society uh, as well. So that, that's, if you like, our mantra about what works and how we persuade our fellow citizens that we're not throwing good money after bad. Uh, let me just finish up uh, with a brief uh, overview of, uh, if you like, the appeal that the report is making, because I think the report is an appeal, um, the, uh, and it's an appeal in the face of this uh, UN, uh, the, the underfunded UN appeal, really which I think is, is, is troubling, and um, I noticed, actually, that the, the British government hasn't followed your advice from the uh, International Development Committee report of 2012, which was to increase humani the humanitarian component of the development package. The, the UK um, uh, humanitarian package is still stuck at £15 million a year, I think I'm right in saying, and hasn't been increased, despite the fact that the £178 million uh, pound uh, overall development spend has been held to, we haven't managed to make uh, successfully make the case that the humanitarian side of this needs to be increased. Um, so the report is an appeal for long-term commitment uh, from donors. Uh, it's an appeal, uh, secondly, to respond quickly to life-saving needs as well as the um, longer-term needs, and I think it is right to talk about life-saving. It's an appeal, thirdly, and there is a danger that this gets forgotten, uh, it's an appeal to break the displacement cycle. I mean, 30 years of civil war have created a cycle of displacement. There's one and a half million Afghans in Pakistan, uh, a million Afghans, uh, that's just registered numbers, there's a million uh, Afghans, or at least 800,000 Afghans in Iran. Uh, and there were, in 2013, 650,000 Afghans displaced by conflict within their own country, IDPs. And this notion that we have to address populations on both sides or all sides of the borders, both in Afghanistan and in neighboring countries, if we are to dis break the displacement cycle, is very, very significant. The report draws attention to the um, Afghan government's um, internal displacement plan. I I've got the title of it wrong. Someone can correct me if they have access to the report. But there's a, a plan for dealing with internally displaced the people. The IDP policy. The IDP policy. Um, but it's been, it's been announced but not implemented, I think I'm uh, right in saying. So there are responsibilities on the Afghan government in respect of IDPs, but there are also issues across uh, border. Uh, the fourth appeal is for 
um, donors to think local, not just to think about uh, great projects, that the, the success is going to be built locally in, in Afghanistan. And, and, and for, finally, fifthly and finally, the report is an appeal to align the humanitarian and the development effort and to get the balance right. And at the moment, that's, uh, we think, not being uh, done. So I think that uh, it's uh, fair to say that there is a sober message in the report. Uh, we, don't, um, we don't shy away from recognizing the gains that have been made in the last decade. But um, equally, it's important to be very sober minded about the cost uh, the cost to Afghans, but obviously the cost in, uh, to Western countries as well, both in human and in financial uh, terms. And the report starts by saying that 2014 is a year of transition. And essentially our message is that we can't afford it to be a year of divorce, uh, that we owe it uh, to ourselves as well as to the Afghans to make sure that we learn the right lessons of effective uh, development and humanitarian assistance, uh, that the needs are uh, great enough to warrant continued investment and doubling down on the investment that's been started, but there are enough lessons about good spend versus bad spend uh, to call for reform as well. So um, I hope uh, that you will um, take that as a sort of overview. I hope that's a reasonably accurate overview of what's, of what's in the document. And I hope you'll excuse me if I uh, leave you, Kevin, to chair uh, what I hope will be a really interesting discussion w with the panel that you've got. David, thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. So, overview. <laughs> thank you, David. That, that sets us up very well. Um, right, thanks so, a lot, everybody. Thank you. Um, so, um, Chelsea, over to you. Well, David's provided a, a great overview of the report, so um, maybe I'll just use this opportunity to talk a little bit more um, about the Afghan voices that we heard doing this research. Uh, and as, as David mentioned, we, um, we consulted a total of 136 um, of our Afghan staff. Our staff in country are 99% Afghan. They um, are often from uh, at least nearby the communities where they work. They live in those communities. Um, so where they're working is very much um, their home. And um, we uh, asked them about their hopes and their fears um, for 2014 in particular. Um, and also we asked them to reflect about um, what the communities th where they're living and working, um, what they'd heard from them about what, what they were um, concerned about this year. Um, and they told us about the, the, the three transitions uh, that they're facing this year. So one, of course, is, is the military transition. Um, that's the withdrawal, the drawdown of international troops, which is supposed to be complete by the end of this year. Um, there's also a political transition. transition. So um, Afghans are electing a, a new president um, this Saturday. Um, and that election um, has been so far fraught with insecurity, as I'm sure you've seen in the news. It's been a, a, a very volatile time. Um, and there's also a, a serious economic transition that has started. Um, and it's unclear yet how, uh, just how much Afghans are going to, to feel that impact and when. But as international, um, as international organizations, international funding leaves the country, um, that means that a lot of people are losing their jobs. And it's unclear um, uh, where people will be able to, to make a livelihood and the kind of programs that have helped people develop their livelihoods. Uh, it's unclear whether they'll be able to continue. So um, we asked them about their top concerns. And not surprisingly, uh, 102 of 124 staff members that we um, asked, we uh, uh, consulted in a questionnaire, said that insecurity was their top concern. Um, and this isn't just about um, violence, although that's certainly part of it. Um, violence, uh, uh, casualties have ridden, risen quite sharply in the last couple of years. And in fact, last year was the, um, was the deadliest year for, uh, for women and children since 2009. Um, so it's very serious. But, um, but insecurity also affects people in other ways. It means that people aren't able to go to markets to buy things. It means that they can't um, go to their fields to farm. Um, and importantly, it also means that people are displaced. So as David was saying, there are 650,000 people that are displaced now. This is a huge rise uh, from last year. Uh, or from previous years, so I think uh, 124,000 new people displaced last year alone. So it's a, a very serious numbers. Um, but our the staff that we talked to were um, uh, were also very concerned about meeting their basic needs. So they were concerned about um, livelihood opportunities and job creation. What would happen to them? The, the uh, staff in Kabul were worried about what would happen. 
um, what would happen to them and their families um, once uh, international organizations left. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of them were also worried about educational opportunities, and, and not just for, for children, um, but also for adults. Um, where would uh, people be able to get training for work? They felt that, uh, um, that they'd been able to make a lot of gains in this area, and they worried that, that they would lose the progress that they've made if um, international funding that helps sustain these programs stopped. Um, but despite all these concerns, the, the strong message that we got from our staff um, and that they're getting from their communities is that really good work has taken place uh, and that it's going to be able to continue as long as the international community doesn't um, wash their hands of Afghanistan, as long as th they continue to support communities. Um, so I thought I'd share uh, one story of um, uh, just an example of the kind of successful <coughs> approach to aid that we're advocating in this report. And this is the kind of approach that um, that is uh, is founded and centered on small communities. It's based on what communities want, um, villages of people identifying their own needs, being supported in carrying out aid programs um, where appropriate, um, taking a lot of the responsibility in implementing them, having a stake in monitoring it to make sure that uh, the money is spent in the way that they said was important. Um, and, and these are programs that are sensitive um, culturally and religiously. They're appropriate for the context of Afghanistan. That's hugely important. And that's the way that we have to, that's the way that we and other organizations have been working and have to continue working in the future if we're going to keep supporting Afghan communities. So one example for you is um, from a, a village elder uh, in Helmand province who, uh, who talked to IRC about what happened when the IRC first came to um, offer education services in the community. So the IRC would have come and talked to um, the local council there about what the community needed. Um, and he, um, as one of the local leaders at first, um, was completely resistant to this. His experience with NGOs had been only negative previously. Um, he felt that NGOs came, uh, they took information, and then they disappeared. Um, but he said that uh, because there were staff who kept coming back to him, talking to him, listening to what he wanted, taking him seriously, um, he eventually was willing to give this a try and try uh, this community-based education. So this is a school for a community that doesn't have access to, to conventional school. Um, and he was so impressed with it. He said that um, for the first time, um, he saw uh, an organization working for our children just as they would for their own children. Um, and because of that, now he helps them uh, run the school, and um, he sends all his, his sons and daughters, his grandchildren, um, have gone through the school. So this is a drop in the bucket, but it's just one example um, of how, uh, an, an inter how the international community can support someone on a very local level to do something that they've identified that they needed. Um, and that's, th that's the kind of thing that we're advocating for, and we know it can keep, it can, it can work. Um, even in, in pretty tough situations, um, even during these transitions that Afghanistan is facing now. Chelsea, thank you. <laughs> okay, so for this um, next session, we're going to have 20 minutes or so of um, me firing questions at you guys. And so, John, just, just to start, maybe with one of the issues that David raises, because this question of how do we align the humanitarian effort with a development effort in a country you know, w where there are going to be multiple agencies, serious problems with coordination, and you know, whatever comes out of the election, a, a relatively weak mm -hmm. government. I mean, it's something that you've spoken about and written about in your previous capacity. I just wondered maybe if you could share your, your thoughts on that. Yes, I mean, I think there's, a, there's quite a lot of angles to it. I mean, coordination is always a problem, not just in Afghanistan, in, in the humanitarian field, because it's a very fragmented field with, with arguably too many actors in it, but that's not a, a problem we can cure. Uh, just talking about Afghanistan, it was more complicated in Afghanistan because um, there were a lot of other actors there. I'm talking about the last 10 years since, uh, or 13 years since, since 2001. Um, because there was very little space, as it were, in a very crowded field um, dominated by security thinking and political thinking to get the attention focused on, on either development or even less humanitarian issues. And there was an awful lot of actors trying to do things for the right reasons but not necessarily succeeding. So, the, I mean, for example, the country was divided in, in some respects into different areas with different countries taking responsibility for them through these 
uh, provincial reconstruction teams, PRTs and centres, uh, fragmenting the effort from the start, meaning that coordination between the, uh, the donors was, was, was not good. Um, many of the donors were, were tackling it in very different ways, some were tackling it in a very security-oriented way, some of them were very development-focused, and some somewhere in between. Um, so, you know, bringing all that together uh, effectively in a, a very difficult security situation uh, with a very weak government, uh, with all kinds of problems as its own, you know, was a unique challenge, and, and it, you know, that showed I in many respects um, uh, through this multiplicity of actors. Uh, and there were also particular challenges, um, as I say, because of this lack of space for uh, humanitarian and development concerns to, to find its proper voice in establishing coordination mechanisms which could be separate from the military um, domination, if you like. Uh, and I went out to, to Afghanistan in, in 2009 and I had a long battle with, with, the, uh, with the, with actually with the UN there about trying to move away the UN, the, the OCHA coordination structure from the rest of the UN, uh, because it, it, if we didn't do that, it, we were simply perceived as too close to the UN's political agenda, which is one of supporting the government, too close to ISAF, because their job was also supporting the government, and therefore not neutral enough. And in fact, a lot of the NGOs at various times in Afghanistan threatened to divorce themselves completely from the UN's normal coordination strategy because of this perception of being too close to the UN. So it was a very, very difficult context uh, in which to operate. Now, I suppose the question is, is it going to get any easier? Uh, I mean, I've no idea whether the security situation may get easier. It may even get worse. Uh, it, we, we can't rule that out. Um, but there may be more opportunities when you, when you don't have uh, this, this sort of large military presence um, to get a bit more of a focus on, on development and humanitarian issues, a bit more space for that, a few less actors competing for to, to, to dominate, if you like, um, uh, this le without this division of the country into different um, international areas, uh, there may be more space to, to get that coordination better, and it absolutely needs to happen. And also, and this, I think this is what you were suggesting originally, to try and bridge the humanitarian development divide. Now, you know, we all have been talking about the humanitarian development divide forever. Um, it's still there. <laughs> uh, there. There's no magic solution to it. Um, but I think it is essential in a place like Afghanistan to try to, to bridge it, as David was talking about, um, because otherwise we are always tackling symptoms and never really tackling enough underlying causes. Um, so we have to make sure we're doing both of those, and both of those with equal urgency. Of course, we have to tackle the immediate humanitarian needs when they're there, but we also have to, to tackle some of the underlying problems that give rise to those needs, which are um, poor agriculture, uh, poverty in general, population rise, um, <coughs> you know, all the difficulties which go with that lack of infrastructure. Mm -hmm lack of resilience. If we don't tackle some of those, then we're, we're simply condemned to be there for another 30 years, you know, dealing with the same problems without making any real progress. Thank you. Um, Ashley, let, let me go to you. Um, I, I want to ask Sid one question, but in two parts. So I, I know you've been following events up to the election pretty closely. And, you know, there have clearly been some quite disturbing signs or potentially worrying signs in the run-up to the election. So uh, the, 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 the first part of the question is just, you know, how do you see the election playing out? And you know, what are the prospects for it going peacefully, you know, reaching a conclusion that creates some sort of stability in, in government? But the, 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 the second part is I just want to get a sense from you of how hopeful you are about the post-election period. Wow, those are, those are easy questions. <laughs> um, what I would say about the elections is that um, we've seen in the past two presidential elections increasing levels of fraud, increasing levels of violence, um, attempts in the aftermath of these elections to, to remedy that through electoral reform, but that, that certainly uh, did not go so well in 2009. So what you've seen is there have been electoral laws passed, there have been more sophisticated tracking mechanisms uh, put in place. Uh, there's barcode scanning on some of the polling stations and the ballot boxes. But what will it really amount to? All this money, all this presence, um, will it actually deter fraud and allow Afghans to vote? And they overwhelmingly do want to vote. There was a, a, a survey done by the Free and Fair Election Foundation which found that you know an overwhelming number of Afghans wanted to go to the polls 
only a quarter of them believed the election would be somewhat clean. Uh, so while there's enthusiasm, there's a great deal of well-founded skepticism. There's also, as you point out, a high level of violence. You've seen these spectacular attacks in Kabul and indeed right throughout the country against the election commission, against foreigners, and the impact has been that two of the three major independent international observer missions have withdrawn their international staff or, or significantly curtailed their activities. So the question is not how much fraud will there be, but will there be anyone there to significantly detect it? Um, and it's important to detect it because that's the, that's the thing that gives it legitimacy. I think um, without those watchdogs there, without people at the polling stations on the ground, we're not going to know. Um, they're already estimating that 10% of polling stations will be closed for security reasons. So how many Afghans will be able to vote. I think what you're going to see, and this is not a controversial uh, prediction, is, is an election that, that drags through uh, until summer will likely have a runoff. Um, but that long process and staying invested as, as members of the international community in that long process to see that it is re resolved transparency, uh, transparently and, and with a legitimate outcome is, is really important. So I think that's the general picture of how the elections Will go. They won't be entirely free, fair, or secure. But what what matters, and you rightly point out, is something that is seen as legitimate by the Afghan people. Now, how hopeful am I post elections in terms of the scenario? It, it doesn't look good. I mean, we've seen in the past six months. I was just down in Kandahar and I was in Kabul, and the security situation is is worse than I've I've ever seen it. Um, and people are very scared, both internationals who are increasingly leaving or withdrawing, withdrawing back into their compounds in Kabul um, or to neighboring countries where they're beginning to base their operations uh, in preparation for what they see as an unstable post-2014 scenario. Um, but Afghans themselves are, are increasingly frightened about their future. Chelsea mentioned unemployment, but I think a lot of a lot of Afghans, those who work with international agencies and the UN, are worried about whether or not they'll be targeted, um, whether or not their families will be safe, and these kinds of things. So it's not only livelihoods, but it's it's human security and, and, and personal security. What you are seeing, and you brought this up before, is uh, you know the situation with ISAF's pullout so far has not improved um, conditions for aid agencies. It's become increasingly volatile, unpredictable, harder to work. Um, and, and Sir Holmes is right. Whether or not that will continue, we can't predict. But right now, the situation is incredibly uncertain. Thank you. Chelsea, could, could you just maybe take up one of the themes that David touched on, which is the refugee mm -hmm. population and the IDP population? Because you know, this is clearly going to be a, you know, a absolutely critical to a successful transition. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as, as David was saying, um, there are just huge numbers of uh, refugees and IDPs. So, about um, 1.6 million registered in Pakistan, um, uh, over 800,000 in Iran, and uh, in addition to these very high numbers of internally displaced people. Um, so, um, the, there, are, there are a number of strategies to, to try to deal with it, and I think the international community can engage with them in a couple of ways. Um, so uh, there's a regional strategy, strategy between um, Iran, Afghanistan, um, uh, Pakistan, and the UNHCR. And through this strategy, it's, uh, it's the solution strategy for Afghan refugees, they've agreed um, to work together to help promote um, safe return uh, for Afghans, um, also to uh, help promote sustainable um, solutions for Afghans once they've actually gone home so that they can stay there safely, um, so they have opportunities there, um, and, um, and support for host countries. So uh, Iran and Pakistan have been hosting Afghans now uh, for three decades. Uh, this is the largest protracted uh, displacement in the world, um, although I think soon to be surpassed by Syria. Um, but it, just huge numbers of people, and there, I think, is a little bit of a sense of, um, s of fatigue in the region um, from having this responsibility for such a long time. Um, and so I think uh, our role um, in I as, as the international community is to make sure that we support 
um, this solution, solution strategy, um, providing support for host countries so that they can keep um, assisting refugees that are living there, and also uh, supporting Afghanistan so that they can um, they can create conditions for return because often when Afghans do come back from Iran or from Pakistan, um, it can be difficult for them to stay. They'll 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 come back and they find that they don't have their land anymore. They don't have housing. They have no education or job opportunities, and so they're displaced again. Um, the same thing happens for displaced people. So uh, within Afghanistan, um, they'll uh, be displaced, come home, and then find that they need to be dis that, that they need to leave again, and they're displaced again. Um, so. Uh, there's a strategy internally, which um, David referred to, which is the, the national IDP policy. This is a, um, a landmark policy for the government of Afghanistan, um, who should be commended for, for their work in passing it. Um, they adopted it in February, and now they need to implement it. Um, so the, the policy uh, guarantees right to, to freedom of movement. It means that um, IDPs, no matter where they are in Afghanistan, have the right to be there and stay there. And it, it, um, uh, the IDP policy also uh, specifies who in the government is responsible for, for taking care of IDPs. So it's, um, it's, it's a great policy, and now they need to take steps to make sure that it actually um, is rolled out on the ground, that people get the training that they need um, to implement it. And I think we can help that through um, through training and through funding. Thank you. Um, so, John, I want to go sli slightly off script with this question. Cool. Um, <laughs> no, because I, I mean, partly because there's nobody better than you to, to answer it. But you, you know this this issue of the humanitarian development divide or the con con continuum. Um, you know, and and all of us speak that language. You know, we all know. You know, we need to get over the division, and we. we but, but in practice, it's tremendously difficult to do. The, you know, I mean, uh, the reality on the ground is that you've got humanitarian agencies that are trying to fund, you know, what is in real people's lives, things like health and education, which are about long-term development, but from very short-term budgets, which are contingent on appeals. And as, as David said, you know, the, the appeals don't have a great record. And it's certainly very difficult to plan on the basis of, of appeals. So, th I mean, the, the, the question is, in a way, like how in a practical way, do we move from stating the principle that you know we, we all want to sort that divide out into making it operational and doing things differently? I mean, you know, what would a practical strategy in Afghanistan look like for doing that? I think if I had the answer to that question, <laughs> which a lot of people have been thinking about for a long time, I mean, I think part of the answer, part of the problem is that money comes from different pots. Um, and it's easier to, to in some ways uh, to get money for immediate humanitarian needs than it is for development needs in very difficult conflict situations. Um, and that drives people to behave in certain ways and it drives agencies to behave in certain ways even though most agencies are both humanitarian and development. They have these internal divides as well as the external divides. And somehow we've never managed really to, to overcome that. I think part of the problem or, or part of the solution is um, that humanitarians have to stop thinking just about the immediate um, needs um, and development actors have got to stop thinking or extend their thinking not just from saying well I, I need a 20-year plan uh, because otherwise I can't do anything I need to have the winner I know exactly where I'm going to thinking about where can I produce some quick wins as well on the ground um, which which you know there may not be part yet of a sort of hugely development World Bank UN whatever it is strategy but uh, people need clinics and and, uh, and and education and some roads they need some stuff they can see that things are getting better when the conflict is over uh, because those two mentalities are very different the, yeah. the short-term mentality I've got to help people I've got to keep people keep people alive and I know I haven't got time to work out a 10-year plan I need to know what, what to do now and the other saying well I need time to write a report and you know we somehow got to bring those two together, and it's and it's doing it in that that time scale. Yeah. Uh, now I think that there are things happening um, at the UN level. There are big attempts to bring people like Valerie Amos, my successor, and Helen Clark, the head of UNDP, have joint visits to places and send the signal. This the old ways of doing things are, are no longer good enough. But uh, so I think it, th there are some movements in the right direction. Do I think it's going to change overnight? No, I don't think it is, I'm afraid, mm. because it is very deep-rooted. And it, um, you know, If it was easy to fix it, we'd have fixed it already. Mm. It's because it's, it's linked to, to funding uh, and it's linked to the way people behave. Um, but we do have to get over it, and we've been talking about this not only in conflict situations but also in natural disaster situations where 
um, it, you know, it, it's ridiculous to divorce the response to it from the, the, the work that needs to go to, to, to make sure that, not that it doesn't happen, you can't stop it happening, uh, but that it doesn't have the impact it would have. So that's why natural disasters is always the wrong word, okay. um, because it's, uh, they're man-made disasters, essentially. Uh, that, you know, we, we're trying to do it in that context, and I think it, it applies in these contexts as well, because Afghanistan is, of course, vulnerable to natural disasters as well as to... See, I can't help using the word either. Um, to natural disasters as well as to conflict. Thank you. I, actually, maybe just to take that theme up with you as, as well, because, you know, in any constellation of circumstances, NGOs are going to be really critical actors post in, in, the, in this transition, but they're going to be operating in a very different political and social environment than has been the case for the past decade or so. So I, I just wonder from your perspective and having done a lot of work on the, you know, the role of NGOs in development at a community level, what, what, are you, what, what are some of the changes that need to happen in NGO practices looking ahead? Well, I think the landscape, I mean, David touched upon this before, uh, that we know after 10 years operating in this environment, we have a lot of uh, bad practice, but we also have a lot of good practice to, to build upon, regardless of what the future holds. Um, I think mean, it's deeply concerning that the money is decreasing, uh, but if I may, one of the effects is that perhaps some of that bad practice, this rush to spend money quickly to not think about the long term, um, that, that will sort of you know, deteriorate as well, this sort of quick impact uh, mentality in Afghanistan that's, that's uh, been the characteristic of, of most of the, the spending in Afghanistan for the past decade. Um, so perhaps there's a chance to think longer term. Afghanistan's humanitarian crisis is not one that uh, has roots in natural disasters or, or, or anything in, in that respect that could not be predicted. I mean, what we see are, are seasonal floods in the north of Afghanistan, for example, that happen in the same places every single year. Uh, people are thrown into humanitarian crisis simply because of economic shocks, because they live at such sort of desperate levels of, of grinding poverty. So it's, it's a chronic crisis. Um, and in order to, to address these crises, you need to get at the roots uh, of the, the deeply entrenched poverty and vulnerability in Afghanistan. So the solution is a development solution. And, and I think it's right to talk about thinking long term um, in terms of our responses to crises. And that's something that a lot of NGOs in Afghanistan simply have not done. They keep uh, responding to the floods every year in Samangan without looking at you know, how to fix water management, how to um, do some disaster mitigation in an effective, durable way. Um, so these are some of the lessons that I think we have to learn in Afghanistan is investing in the long term. But that also goes back to donors who, again, have these very short time frames, both with development projects, ironically, as well as with humanitarian projects. And I think, again, if you want to see any sustainable change, you do have to think over the long term. Sure, there are steps which might yield intermediate outcomes that show progress, but you do need to have a 20-year plan. It's one of the poorest countries, the least developed in the world. Um, and, and even with less money, I think there are things that can seriously be done. Thanks, Ashley. Chelsea, just um, I mean, maybe taking up some of those themes about the, the role of NGOs, that you know, there are a lot of things in this debate that are easy to say but tough to do. Mm -hmm. And da you know, David made the point that you know, what we really need to see is community-driven development, mm -hmm. because that's, you know, that's what's going to make a difference. And actually, your report gives a number of good examples of, of that. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, I, I think the truth is that most aid donors find that very difficult. You know, I mean, aid donors are much more comfortable, you know, working in big sector-wide strategies, working with through national budgets, mm -hmm. and actually, there's a lot of evidence that you know that's really what you need for effective delivery. So, I guess the you know the big question for Afghanistan, I mean, almost like the question I asked John, actually, I mean, how do you turn this great principle mm -hmm. of community-driven development into something that donors can can in a very practical way support and work with? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it, it requires um, some degree of flexibility. Um, Afghanistan isn't, um, isn't one homogenous place. Um, people in different places have different needs and also different relationships um, uh, with their central government, just like in other countries where um, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the country isn't urban, um, and a lot of the country is um, actually quite, quite far from the capital. 
Um, so I think that I think the donors can um, be involved in projects like I think the National Solidarity Program is a good example where um, they're giving money to uh, to the the government of Afghanistan, which through um, through their uh, their uh, rural ministry um, is giving small grants to these uh, community development councils. And then the community development councils um, in thousands of villages throughout the country can then work on identifying their own needs, so what's appropriate for them in their own context. Um, and uh, you know, maybe that's something um, that's very specific to uh, early, uh, early recovery, um, resilience building programming for places that um, have a lot of humanitarian needs. Maybe it's longer term development focus. Um, but the important thing is that uh, the people who live there and work there are the ones making that decision, um, but they're empowered by kind of a, um, a central and, and really well-funded, well-monitored program to be able to do that. And that's it's also nice because it, it, it lets donors um, you know, contribute to a, a bigger pool of programming, a, a, bigger, uh, a bigger program on the whole that kind of impacts um, uh, uh, in in different little communities, depending on what they need. So um, those would be the those are the kind of approaches that um, that I'd argue uh, we should we should continue with, um, particularly when we know that there's going to be less funding going around. Thanks. Could I add, add to that point? I think that that mm -hmm. particularly in situations like Afghanistan, which are very dangerous and extremely volatile, um, that working with local communities is a security strategy, if you like. Uh, because it becomes extremely difficult to operate <coughs> unless you have the acceptance of the local community at the local community level, who are then going to be the people who say to, for example, the Taliban, whoever it might be, don't come and blow that school up just because you think it was built by foreigners. You know, we actually wanted that school and we wanted those people here. Mm -hmm. So th getting that kind of acceptance uh, through these community uh, programs, very, very closely locally community-based programs, is one way of continuing to operate whatever's happening in the politics and the security situation more broadly. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important. I mean, and that's why IRC was b there before ISAF, they were there after ISAF. They have to go on working with, with the communities which are going to be there also before and after ISAF, and therefore not be dependent on exactly what's happening in Kabul or Herat or mm -hmm. Jalalabad or wherever it may be. Thanks. Actually, you, you, you've written about this pretty extensively. That, and uh, you've, you've made the point that in the past that, you know, approaches to stabilisation have made it very difficult to do development work at a community level, which goes back to the thing that Chelsea raises, actually. But I, I wonder in this sort of, in the new set of circumstances, how you see that situation evolving, you know, after, with, the, with the drawdown of troops? Yeah, I think what we've seen, um, and this goes back to work that we did um, in looking at local communities and perceptions of the Taliban, of aid work. Um, and one of the things we heard, there's actually one of the towns we were talking to, and we asked him about, you know, who do you let in to work? And he says, oh, we don't, we don't let in those PRT NGOs. And it was one, it was one entity to him, a PRT NGO, um, which I think really illustrates how perceptions have been tainted of, of local communities, as well as the Taliban. And of course, the Taliban are part of those local communities, right? Um, and so that's going to take a long time to undo that suspicion of aid agencies being aligned with uh, the international military effort aligned against the Taliban. Um, and the fact that few have really sought to engage the Taliban in a structured, impartial, neutral way um, in line with humanitarian principles. However, I, I think, you know, it's right, this, this local grassroots community acceptance approach, when done correctly, um, can, can really enable access to areas of the country that are under insurgent or anti-government uh, group control. There are examples from Kandahar and Helmand, certainly, of multi-mandate US-funded NGOs who engage both with the Taliban and with the government, as well as myriad other uh, ad hoc armed groups, in order to gain access to do long-term development as well as humanitarian work. So there are models of how it can be done well. However, uh, to the, the question you asked me before, what can NGOs do better, I think a lot of them don't do it terribly well. Um, there's been a reticence to really take on uh, the role of directly dealing with armed groups as well as the government. Um, and, and that comes from fear of, of having their funding cut for talking to the Taliban or fear of getting kicked out by the Afghan government and these kinds of things. But increasingly, we're seeing in order to work in vast areas of the country, I would say 
the majority of the country at this point, you need to be willing to negotiate and talk to all sides. And part of that is having good relationships with the community, but another part of it is really having an intentional, structured, smart, consistent strategy for engagement. Thank you. Um, so, Jenna, I want to ask one, one more mm. question before we throw, throw it open. Um, you, in your, you, you wrote a very wonderful book, Politics <laughs> of Aid, which... Um, Politics I, of Humanity. Politics of Humanity, I'm sorry, which <laughs> I, I give a plug to everybody should uh, re read the book. But you, you, you make, there's a very nice um, comment in it that you make the, where you say humanitarian support is, you, is a moral imperative. It's not part of a political strategy. But you've often observed that the humanitarian system is you know, af clearly affected by, by politics. And I guess that you know, the political environment in Afghanistan now is going to change politically in a very dramatic way. And perhaps one of the challenges is, you know, how do we get a broader range of actors who might be engaged in the humanitarian sphere without it becoming politicised? And, you know, I just wondered what, what your, your, your take on the prospects of that might be. Well, it is a huge challenge. I mean, it, it's, you know, you are trying to deliver hum humanitarian aid, and the same applies to, to development aid to a large extent. Uh, in a neutral and independent and impartial way in highly politicised situations. And there aren't many situations which are more politicised than Afghanistan. Actually, there are. Gaza is probably worse in some ways. But uh, it is highly politicised. And you, you know, you're, you're fighting the whole time to stop being instrumentalised by people who want to use what you're doing. Uh, you know, the, the most crass um, sort of examples of this would be an American uh, politician or commander saying that humanitarian aid can be a false multiplier. Uh, normally, that's not as bad as that. Uh, but, you know, there were also examples of, of um, uh, commanders effectively saying to villages, you know, if you cooperate and give us information, then, you know, we'll build you a school. You know, well, obviously, that's, uh, that undermines the whole basis of what we're doing. So we need to try to, to keep that neutral balance despite being in these highly politicised situations. And that does being being aware of the politics. <laughs> Uh, you can't pretend the politics is not there, as David said right at the beginning. You have to work with the politics and keep your balance despite the politics. And that doesn't mean you have to engage with the politics, and it means you have to engage with the military as well, uh, which isn't always easy from either side's point of view, but it's absolutely essential if you're going to make these things work properly. Um, so I think uh, you know, we need to go on doing that. I absolutely agree with what Ashley was saying, that you need to have not only the assent of the local community, but you need to talk to the organisations which have some influence over them. Uh, with some kind of structured dialogues. It's not very easy to have a structured dialogue with somebody like the Afghanistan Taliban, mm. uh, to say the least. But it's not impossible either if you go about it in the right way. Uh, and that's what's going to have to happen. Now, the question is, is this going to get easier in Afghanistan with the departure of ISAF, um, which in some ways you can imagine it might, uh, or is it going to get harder? Because you're going to have a government which is um, possibly even weaker uh, possibly falling apart, uh, your main interlocutors on the military side are no longer going to be Western forces, but Af the Afghan army and the Afghan police. And, and people have very legitimate doubts about both of those institutions. And, you know, you may have uh, doubts about how much the Pentagon understands uh, the principles of humanitarian aid. I, you can be pretty sure what the Afghan army thinks about the principles of humanitarian aid. In other words, they don't think about them at all. So, uh, you know, engaging with those kind of actors is going to be even harder. But my uh, recommendation is not that you abandon the effort, but you need to try even harder when the situations are like that. And that also means, and it goes back to the coordination point, there have to be people doing it on behalf of the community as a whole. Not every NGO and every organisation can do it for themselves. Uh, so there, there are ways of trying to negotiate access and acceptance uh, on a more structured basis, you know, maybe with somebody doing it on behalf of the NGOs or maybe the UN doing it. I mean, there are issues with that sometimes. Uh, but it can be done, but it needs to be done in a, in a coordinated and structured and, and thought about way, uh, which is relevant to the politics of the time, whatever they might be. Thank you. Um, so um, now it's your turn. Uh, what, what I'd like to do now is pass it over to you. I'm going to take questions in groups of um, three, two or three, um, depending on their length. And I would very much prefer brief comments and questions to the speakers. If you, if you want to address a, a particular speaker, either Ashley um, in New York or, or Sir John or Chelsea here, say that. If, if you do want to make a more general comment, do, do keep it relatively short. Um, and also say who you are, please. Thank you. 